Living a life of intention starts within. Dora and I are excited to help you find the path to co-mindfulness living through our co-mindfulness masterclass. Our seven co-mindfulness principles will take you on a remarkable path towards health and happiness. For more information and to sign up for the masterclass, visit comindfulnessproject.com. People are yearning for information, having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dr. Roger Landry is our guest today on Health Gig. Dr. Landry is a preventive medicine physician, author of the award-winning Live Long, Die Short, a guide to authentic health and successful aging book. And he's also the president of Masterpiece Living, which is a group of multidiscipline specialists in aging who partner with communities to assist them in becoming destinations for continued growth. Trained at Tufts University School of Medicine and Harvard University School of Public Health, Dr. Landry specializes in building environments that empower older adults to maximize their unique potential. And Dora and I were thrilled when Dr. Landry said that he could join us today on Health Gig and go through his top 10 tips on how we all can age healthier and stronger. So welcome, Roger, to Health Gig. It's such a joy for us to have you here. We have a mutual friend in John Cavanaugh, and he's told us all about you. So we're thrilled you're with us today. I'm honored. Thank you very much. Well, Trisha and I were just so fascinated with you and your book and your movement. And we wanted to talk to you about all of that. And so let's just start with the concept of masterpiece living. And could you tell us what it is? We're a multi-specialty group, and it grew out of the MacArthur Foundation 10-year-long study on aging that happened in the 80s. Jonas Salk was on the board of that at the time. And that 10-year-long study smashed the stereotype of our understanding of what it takes to age well. You know, we thought it was genes and you know, a little bit of luck, but they told us that 70% of how we age is really due to our lifestyle. So the choices we make every day. My brother happened to be the CFO of MacArthur Foundation at the time. So he and Jonas Salk jumped into a cab together after they had given their final results of that 10 year long study. And that lifestyle is the major determinant. And Jonas was all excited. And he said, you know, but nothing's going to happen unless someone applies it. So my brother, some years later, was in a position to be able to get a group together. He got some of the people from the 10-year-long study, MacArthur study, and some industry experts because Jonas had said, you might want to start with senior living, kind of get a captive audience. And it's a great place to start because we want to track data. So we got some people from senior living and he called me, my brother, and it just happened to be an excellent time for me. I had been out of the military working in healthcare thinking that the job was going to be all about prevention, prevention, prevention. That's my specialty, preventive medicine. And it was more about sick, 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 make better, make better, make better. You know, what you expect in healthcare. I jumped at the chance. We developed it over a five, six, seven year period. The whole idea was to give older adults the tools to take a look at their lifestyle. Where am I now? What's the snapshot? Physically, mentally, socially, spiritually. And help me understand where my risks are and help me to get content and learn about what I need to do. And the partners we have are communities. So have this environment where I am be supportive of that. So we track the data and it's been fantastic right in line with the MacArthur study. And so that's what's been happening for actually it's coming up on 20 years since we started talking about it to where we are now. Your book was so fun to read, Live Long, Die Short a guide to authentic health and successful aging. And what was really fun to go through were the 10 tips that you give that we thought would be really fun for our listeners if we kind of explored what they are so that we can all apply them. Well, you know, some of these are intuitive and some of them now are highly substantiated by research and can give us a whole lot more return than we ever thought. First tip is use it or lose it. Can you describe that or tell us what that means? Again, that's kind of intuitive. We used to think that we're just going to lose things, you know, as we age. Now we know if we do use it, make the choice to use it, we're less likely to lose at a pace we thought we were going to. I have a great story for this. No one really chooses not to use something. So I was in college and I really messed up my leg on a toboggan, but they fixed it, so to speak, after a long time. But not really. So 40 years later, after being an athlete and military guy, started to get ankle and knee pain. And, you know, that's not me. 
that's not who I am. I'm a healthy, active guy. And, you know, the knee was not too hard. It got that fixed, but the ankle, no one was doing anything about it. So I was feeling bummed about that. And I was a little depressed. I wasn't traveling as much. I wasn't giving talks as much. So when I gave talks, I kind of stumbled over words because I wasn't doing it. Physically, I'd go to the gym, but not as often. And when I did finally go, I couldn't do as much. I was circling the drain. I had a problem. Life threw me a curveball and I wasn't using my faculties and I was losing them. So I found a, a guy up in Boston who fixed the Celtics ankles. So I have a new ankle and a new lease on life. And so I went the other way. I started not circling, but winding up as I felt good about it. So we don't choose it, but life throws us curveballs. And how we respond to that is critical. Whatever you got, use it and continue to use it. Even if it's a little limited than what it was, use it. Just use it. And the next one is keep moving, which kind of is like that, right? Kind of falls right into using it or you're going to lose it. Sure does. You know, a Mayo Clinic paper just recently came out within the last year or so. And the title of the paper was Sitting is the New Smoking. And he did the research. He did the calculation of the risk. And indeed, you know, our sedentary society, which most of us are really when it comes to it, look at it. We're all sitting. I know. What happens when you are too sedentary? Well, it's about a $53 billion price tag in the country for healthcare, just being sedentary. By not moving our muscles with age, they would normally start to lose some of its bulk. But without using them, it's sort of logarithmic. When astronauts went into space and not be able to use muscles and not have gravity to press against, they would come back having lost 15, 20% of their muscle mass in weeks. And so that's our space travel, sitting. So we lose muscle. And with that, as with my story, the more we sit, I think the more we're not as vital. I have a good story. A CEO, a friend of mine, he read my book and he called in all of his executives. And he says, you guys have new parking spots and it's a mile from the door. And so every day they had to walk two miles. And because he knew they'd perform better, they'd be happier, less healthcare costs. And they were feeling so good, they passed it on down in their departments. And it changed the culture of the whole company. Did people complain or did everyone go with it? They were shocked, but it didn't take long where they loved it, actually. So another tip, the third tip, talks about challenging the brain. We all fear dementia and different conditions that happen as we age with the brain. Can you talk a little bit about challenging the brain? I think we feel like we're victims. There's not much we can do. We've heard stories of people who seem to be active and then boom, Alzheimer's hits. And when I went to medical school down in Boston, at the time, that's what they were saying. You know, the brain, you had so many cells and you grew to maturity. And then after that, it was just a long sloping curve of losing neurons and losing ability. Well, we know that's not true now. We know the brain is very dynamic and it has neuroplasticity, which I'm sure you've heard of. And it's the lifelong ability to be able to rewire your brain in response to a disease or an injury or what you ask it to do. I challenge my brain, learning new things. That's the key, learning new things and being physically active because the brain needs nutrients and blood. You do those things and we can see on brain scans, brains getting thicker in areas. Like if you take on a language or a musical instrument, you can see that the brain significantly changes. Then the next one, and we love your tip number four, it's stay connected because Dora and I are doing a lot of work in that area we've talked to you about with our co-mindfulness, but we loved your quote because each of the chapters had the quote and this quote, it's better to eat fries with friends than broccoli alone. Talk to us about that because that is true. This is a basic need we have as a species. We would not have survived had we not banded together in groups. And so it is basic to who we are to be with others. When someone isn't connected, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, dementia, cancer, they're all more common, up to two to five times more common. I had a friend who was a pilot in Vietnam and he was shot down, he was captured, and he was a prisoner for seven years, frequently in solitary and frequently tortured. And he actually told me very privately, I won't mention his name, he was glad when they came to get him in solitary to be tortured because a human would come in. He didn't like the torturing so much, but it was less painful to him than being in solitary. It is an absolutely critical need we have. And so many of us, as we age, self-isolate by staying in a place where it's inevitable we're going to end up with just our spouse or alone. And that's just not who we are. We absolutely need to be with others. 
Tell us the health benefits of being in relationship. And I love the Rosetto story. Well, Rosetto is a town in Pennsylvania, and it was populated by immigrants from Italy, first generation immigrants from Italy also. And someone was studying them because they had a remarkably low incidence of heart disease and stroke in that community. And they studied all the cultural components and all the other components of the society and came to the conclusion that it indeed was the cultural predilection for social connection. We've all been to Italy. We know that this is a country that is about being together. So that was the reason. And so as they live longer in the U.S., the children's and the grandchildren began to be assimilated into the U.S. culture. It wasn't quite the same relative to the social connection. And lo and behold, what did we see? Increased rates of cardiovascular disease. So the next tip is tip number five on lowering risks. And that's where you talk a lot about resilience. Can you talk about resilience, what it means and how important it is to cultivate? Well, in this particular time with COVID, we, uh, with our partners and we all as individuals and members of families, I think we're all seeing an increased need for resilience. For me, resilience is about the head and the heart and the heart, not so much the cardiovascular part, but, you know, the passion and the grit that is associated with the heart and the head, because so much of it is attitude and how we look at things to the extent we're a half full kind of person. We tend to live seven and a half years longer if we're a half full person versus a half empty. It is astounding. So that's a positive attitude, but it's also a matter of expectations. We didn't think a human could run faster than four minutes. Roger Bannister did it in 1954 after decades of scientists saying no one could do it. And 45 days later, someone else did it. And then someone else and someone else. So expectations can be our limitation. It can also be, you know, a stimulus. Great story. Ellen Langer down in Boston is a psychologist. I don't know if you've ever heard of her. She has wrote a book called Counterclockwise. She did an experiment back in the 70s. She took men in their 70s and she did some basic tests on them, vision, hearing, some blood tests, photos, and even some movies at the time of their behavior. And she brought them to an environment where she had recreated the 1950s, which is 20 years before them. And so being in this environment, she saw an amazing change in their behavior, vision, hearing, just how they moved, how much they moved. It all went north, so to speak, better. And basically her research is that what our brain sees as possible and what we want to achieve, the body will try to bring that to reality within reason, of course. But her conclusion, and I agree, is that we fall very short of our expectations especially as we get older. If we buy into the stereotype of aging and it's only about decline, that'll come true for us. We will not do what Roger Bannister did relative to a healthy longevity. So resilience is part of being positive, having expectations. It is about believing that no matter what life throws our way, that we can respond to that. We may not bounce back the way we were before, but there's no reason to think that this means that we're only going to decline. This is really about what's in here, you know, in your heart and in your head. And we're seeing it now in full relief. It's under the spotlight and how we all respond to this huge change in our lives because everyone's life has changed. And as a society, it will really determine who we are as individuals and who we are as a society. We love your next tip, which is never act your age. And you had a great quote. You're not old. You were only born a long time ago. Trisha and I have a lot of people in our family who do not act their age, and it just makes life much more fun. Can you talk about never acting your age? Well, I think what we were talking about with resilience, the half full, the expectations, the Ellen Langer study, I think that is all part of this. If we believe the stereotype, once again, as I mentioned earlier, that will more than likely come true, that getting older is only about decline. Acting your age is buying into that. So we've all been programmed to act our age, and that can be confining if we take it too far. You may know I met Chuck Yeager. I did physicals on Chuck Yeager, who broke the sound barrier. After the physical, which was great, he was telling me stories, and then he said, I plan to break the sound barrier again on, on the 50th anniversary. And I was young and thought I knew all the answers, and I said, but Chuck, you'll be 73 years old. And boy, did he bore into me with those laser eyes and said, what is your point? 
What was my point? It's a number that was determining function. I mean, I'm glad John Glenn didn't think that. I'm glad your grandfather didn't think that. The limitations we have are really based upon our expectations of what we want in our lives and what we can achieve. Right. And your next tip is so great. You know, wherever you are, be there. And again, it's the whole mindfulness idea, right? Can you talk about that and the wisdom that you like to share around that? As I get older, Trish, I think all things come back to mindfulness. In our society, we're so not equipped to deal with the culture and the society that we're living in. We've been on earth a long time and 99% of that we were hunter gatherers and we lived a certain life that was very socially connected. We moved a lot. We used our brain, but, you know, not in school, but we used it in order to survive. Everyone had a role. You never got to a point where old people didn't have a role. And so that's who we really are. So the society that we lived in as hunter-gatherers, we didn't rush around. There was no such thing as time. There was sunrise, sunset seasons. There was a social compact. I'll help you if you help me. There were things that we don't have now. We feel we're kind of alone or maybe with our families in this, but time, time is the big factor in our society. We're not equipped to have a time-based society. That sounds radical and it's not going to change, but what can change is how we look at it. And if we can shut off the stress response, which hurts us physically, cardiovascular, dementia, cancer, and quality of life, we have to be able to be able to shut off that mind, if only for seconds. So whatever that is, meditation, a craft, reading, nature, being with an animal, being with a particular person who isn't annoying after you know too long, that can just shut it off, if only for seconds. I frequently ask artists, what happens to time when they're doing art? And they say, there's no time. It goes away. And they say, I feel marvelous. I feel happy and sometimes even joyful. So we all need that. Again, if only for seconds. And, you know, meditation, that's exactly what meditation is all about. The next tip sort of segues from that, which is find your purpose. And I think people struggle with what a meaningful life really is. And you talk a lot about giving back as part of that. So can you elaborate on that? I don't know if either one of you ever met Mary Oliver. I wish we did. We love Mary Oliver. You know, the line. Tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. I think every day as we get up, we should ask ourselves that question. In my experience, uh, you know, and it's probably who we are as a species, those purposes almost always has to do with other living things. Humans, of course, but, you know, animals, plants, the environment, the planet. These are the things that get people out of bed with passion and it has the ability, I think, just like Ellen Langer showed, to power us through the slings and arrows of life. If you don't have a purpose and something bad happens to you, you pretty much just sort of fade away and you wither. You know, there's a great story. Alfie Date was the oldest man in Australia. And he passed recently, but he was 108. And he got up every day and he knit sweaters for penguins. The penguins had been exposed to oil and they would preen their feathers and ingest the oil and die. And so he would knit these things for the penguins and that did it for him. And that's what it is. It does not have to be braggable, but it has to be something important to you. And without it, we wither. That's amazing. The next one we both loved and we smiled extra because Doro has her new little granddaughter, Dottie. So having children in your life, we love that you added that into this because we're both mothers of four children. We have eight children between us. We've got a lot of experience with children. Yeah. When I wrote this book, I'm trying to think. I remember I'd be in there writing and uh, one of my grandkids, I have four grandkids, she would press her nose against the door and look in there and I'd be writing and I'd turn and there she was and poof, that was the end of writing. How could you not <laughs> respond to that? This is N8. Once again, it's who we are. Children were extremely important as the sign that we were going to survive as a species. And the relationship, especially between older adults and children, is an ancient one because it was the older adults who really took care of children while the parents were hunting and gathering. So I think it's an ancient relationship. And this is about children, but it's also about intergenerational contact. Dostoevsky, the Russian writer, says the soul is healed by being with children the kind of traits that give us resilience, flexibility, positivity, 
you can't help but feel positive when you're with a child or even a young adult. And this whole thing about human capital, you know, elders, you know, up until just 200 years ago, maybe in 250 or the Industrial Revolution, elders were a valuable element of a society. They had the experience, they were survivors, and they were important. You know, we don't see that today. We sort of take all that human capital and push it off to the side. And that's bad for the society, for children, and it's bad for the uh, older adults too, because purpose comes with that. So I think it'll change and it is changing, but we sort of went astray on a number of these things, as you can see along the way, but I, I think we're going to straighten out. Your last tip, which we love as well, is all about laughter. We love the quote, laughter is the shortest distance between two people. It sure is. It's a connector. There's a story of Norman Cousins. It's an old story. In the 70s, he wrote a book, Anatomy of an Illness, and he had been diagnosed with a terminal illness and bummed out, no cure. So he decided to laugh because just so he'd feel better. And he got Marx Brothers movies, Candid Candid episodes, and he laughed. And he laughed himself into remission for 30 years. We didn't know at the time medically what that was, but we do now. These half full people, once again, these positive people, these people who can laugh, their immune system is like turbocharged. They're fun to be with. So it's a human connector. Social connection is there. I mean, you stay at home, say, as you age, maybe just with your spouse, it's rare you belly laugh. Right. <laughs> but when you're with others, then it happens. It really is a social connector and something that is critical. It's a gift to be able to laugh easily. And Trisha and I love His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. He laughs so easily. You can't always understand what he's saying, but you just can't help feel happy when he speaks because he's just such a professional laugher. It is. Just to look at his face. So welcoming. I love what he says about compassion. You know, don't we need that today? He says, if you want to be healthy, be compassionate. If you want to help others, be compassionate. Give us your vision of the future. What do you think it's going to look like for people approaching what we used to be old age? And how's that all going to shift? This is coming from a half full kind of guy. Well, I think this demographic that we've already been talking about a little bit, and I'm part of it for sure, that I don't think we're going to settle for anything but continuing to grow. I think any of the impediments that we see now or the false narratives or the stereotypes, I think they'll be smashed. As a society, we're going to need to engage our elders to deal with the problems of the world, the planet, the environment, society. And so I think since the demographic will be busting down the door, the society will be ready for it also. And so I'm very confident that we will see a little closer to what we've experienced in humanity before this time, an engagement of, of everybody in society, specifically focus on older adults. They will be essential. I think a healthy longevity will be, if not the rule, at least getting close to being the rule rather than the exception. So I think it's a bright future. I think we'll see less violence, less war. It sounds Pollyanna, but I, I honestly do feel that data and experience will show us this is crazy. And the more I think that we do see people who are mindful, it's less likely that you let your mind chase you into the violence and the other negative aspects of human behavior. Again, people will call me Pollyanna, but I believe that the trend will be that way. And we three are all trying to be a part of that. Roger, thank you for coming on Health Gig. Everybody needs to read Live Long, Die Short. I agree. <laughs> thank you so much, Roger. Take care now. Thanks again. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well. To learn more on how to live a co-mindfulness life, visit comindfulnessproject.com.